You say that the US hasn't done nearly enough to prevent a second wave, and in fact, more than a month ago, potentially even earlier, you were writing about the inevitability, I guess, of a second wave. You thought that it would come by October. Has it come sooner than you expected? Uh, we haven't gotten out of the first wave, so it's far too early to talk about a second wave. What we're experiencing is a prolonged wave. It's sort of like a tsunami. It's a wave that just keeps coming and coming and coming. Uh, you can see in the total number of cases in the United States that we climbed up to a steep plateau. As I predicted then, it would take us a long time to climb down off that plateau. We couldn't see the end. And now it seems that that plateau has a rise in it, and we're climbing up to yet a higher part of that plateau. We have yet to climb down. We have now today just about as many people infected on a daily basis, on average about 20, a little over 20,000, as we had over two months ago. On April 1st, we passed the 20,000 mark. That was a long time ago. It's now the middle of June. Uh, so we're not even beginning to see the second wave because we're not done with the first. So at the same time, we continue to hear from voices within the Trump administration, from the president to uh, the Treasury secretary saying that, you know, you can't and won't re-shut down the economy even with the second wave. We heard from Larry Kudlow overnight saying that these numbers that we're seeing in about 22 states are really small bumps and are very much controllable. Is the reopening just a one-way street? I mean, should there be greater consideration be given to whether some of these places should be reopening at all? I think, first of all, the characterization of a little bump is absolutely incorrect. It's dead wrong. There's nothing else you can say about it. All you have to do is look at where the United States has been for the past two and a half months at 20,000 plus cases a day, more or less, give or take 2,000. And that's more about reporting than it is about changes. And now we're rising slightly. So it's not a slight bump. It's 20,000 of our citizens, which means there are about 200,000 people walking around with active infections at any one time in the U.S., and they have been for a long time. So we have not controlled it. We are not controlling it. But that doesn't mean we're not going to reopen. We will reopen. And we're going back to a period at the beginning of my life when antibiotics were just coming in at the end of World War II for civilian use. Penicillin had been discovered. But before that, when we were building our railroads, when we were building our cities, we lived with the possibility that tomorrow would not come. Everybody knew that an infection could spell death. We're back to that era. And by the way, it's something that many of us predicted, that there would come a time, there would come a disease that would take us back to the pre-antibiotic days. The world doesn't end. Your world may end, but mankind goes on and economies go on. We built the world at a time before vaccines and antibiotics. So we will prevail, but we will pay a price. It's a very scary scenario to face at the moment, Dr. Hazeltine. So when it comes to the progress of developments of treatments, what are we seeing so far? Because even this week we had the FDA just withdrawing their emergency use authorization for two malaria drugs that President Trump had touted. Well, those drugs had not, should never have gotten emergency use authorization in the first place. People know that they were ineffective, proven again and again not to be effective in treating the disease or preventing the disease, and indeed are dangerous to take for people with heart conditions. Many of those who are most need of drugs have a heart condition. Uh, whether or not it has accelerated the demise of those people is a topic of debate, but there's evidence that it did. So they were fully justified. That doesn't mean we're not going to have good drugs. If I were to take a bet today on what will come first, effective therapy, and chemo prophylaxis or vaccination, I would give vaccines about 50% chance of being safe and effective, and I would give effective drugs to treat those and to prevent those who are exposed from being coming ill at about 90%. Mm. Uh, we pro may have a vaccine, but we're not going to know how well it works, and we're surely in six months not going to know how safe it is. But with the drugs, I'm reasonably sure that we're going to have a way to help those who are ill and prevent those 
who are exposed from being infected. And those are in an early stage of infection from falling ill. So there will be good news. The, all the attention is on the vaccines today. You're going to see in the next two or three months a good deal of attention on a broad range of drugs. We know that's so because we saw them developed in the time of SARS and MERS. And many of those self-saving drugs are now making their way through their phase one and phase two clinical trials. So there will be good news. So when it comes to the development of those vaccines, will we get that 100% effective vaccine in the first try, or will we have to settle for a vaccine that perhaps doesn't allow the disease to kill you or get you severely ill, but perhaps it helps you, uh, but doesn't actually help you in, in not catching the disease at all? Will we need to settle in a, in a limited efficacy vaccine uh, in the beginning? You know, it's really up to societies and the regulatory authorities to tell us what they are going to settle for. And the problem I see right now is they're not transparent. We don't know what they're willing to settle for. What are the safety criteria that they're going to insist upon? We don't know. What are the efficacy standards? For many vaccines, we know what that means, but we don't know what that means for this vaccine. And many of us are suspicious that they will bend and warp the regulations to fit the current exigencies, whether those are political or economic or psychological. That is a worry. So it's far too early to know. I would say that the broad look at MERS, SARS, and COVID vaccines, we've had 15 years' experience with those, which suggests that these will only be partially effective uh, and will not necessarily develop immunity for a long period of time. Now, we may be lucky. We can't tell. But we'd have to be very lucky, first shot out of the box, to have a vaccine that's entirely safe and entirely efficacious. Chances are it won't be that. It will fall short of that. And then the question is, how far short? How far short does it fall? And if will it falls it fall that short, short enough, if partial so efficacy that, will it, will it is, is all we're going to, well, that's right. If partial me. efficacy is actually your best case scenario, do we get a vaccine at all? Because I know in the 80s we thought people thought that we would have a vaccine for HIV/AIDS, right? And we still don't. Is there a chance that we don't get a vaccine? Well, I was the lone voice saying that we wouldn't. I have to say, I was booed off the stage for saying in 1986, we can't see a vaccine from where we stand today. We need to know a lot more. That was 35 years ago almost. So not everybody thought we'd have a vaccine. Uh, with this, I'm less certain. This, this disease falls somewhere between HIV and polio. People do clear it. They do make immune responses. They may be temporarily immune from it, but then the virus, coronaviruses in general, like the cold viruses, come back the same virus next year to the same person. So it's a much more complicated situation, and we're dealing with a virus that's adapted to our immune system. It's got about 20 different tools it uses to counter our ability to fight it. Now, will it employ, will, will those tools that this virus has impede vaccines? Maybe. There's just too many questions. It's too early. Uh, to know. But what isn't too early to know is what the rules of the game are going to be. How are these going to be tested? And what the regulatory authorities are likely to accept. And that we need to know, and we don't. So everyone I speak to says, oh, I'm waiting until we have a vaccine to travel, or, you know, we'll have herd immunity. If you're talking about reinfection, of the same person, what are the implications for herd immunity and is that another false hope? Herd immunity is a fantasy. It does not exist for these viruses. It's a fantasy and a dangerous fantasy that has led to an extraordinary number of deaths in Sweden. I would eliminate that term from our vocabulary and our thinking. Even at best, it meant perhaps millions of people dying. Are we really that far back to the pre-antibiotic era? Are we really willing to travel back to the Middle Ages in our 
ideas about what we will accept, insofar as your friends that are waiting to travel until we have a safe and effective vaccine, they may wait a very long time. I think a better strategy is to say, I am going to insist and work with my peers to make mm. sure that travel is safe, make sure that the airlines do everything they can to seat us far apart, to make sure the air is safe, to make sure it's sterile, and that I myself am going to take the precautions. I'm going to wear, right. if I travel on a plane, an N95 mask. I'm going to wear goggles that seal tight around my eyes. I'm going to make sure that I do everything so I don't infect my neighbor, and I'm going to not take the plane right. unless the airline assumes the responsibility of protecting me. Dr. That Hasbro. can happen.